Hello, my fellow fallible humans. My name is Tanya McIntyre, and this is the Red Roof Recovery Show. I'm joined today by my longtime partner in marriage and in life and in business, Sir Lancelot, I like to call him. Thank you, darling, for being here. Thanks for uh, letting me participate. Well, you have shared my life and lived with me through my addictions for 20 plus, plus years. Uh, so I love that you bring the perspective of a loved one who is living with someone who is now in recovery from drug and alcohol addictions. I think that offers a good perspective to a lot of the friends and family members who are in the same boat that you found yourself in for most of our marriage and life together. So I think people do appreciate hearing your perspective um, in our relationship and in my recovery because my physical sobriety was just the first step. Uh, mm -hmm. My emotional sobriety is an ongoing process and you, you are thankfully part of that with me as well. So um, I am forever grateful for you hanging in there with me, sweetheart. Oh. As we've said before, that was my choice. The cost-benefit analysis always worked on your in your favor. So there you go. Yes. I think the cost-benefit analysis is good to use for any major decision that you're struggling with in life. Um, as our byline says, it's not just for addictions, it's for life. This is true. Mm -hmm. So what's on the agenda for today, my darling? What are we talking about? Oh, um, I know. Um, yeah. Of course, I get a lot of calls. Uh, from mm -hmm. people who want to inquire about our unique executively appointed residential recovery program that we run through our home here in beautiful Godrich, Ontario, which is called Canada's Prettiest Town. So we are on Lake Huron, a beautiful part of Ontario. And we run, like I said, it's an executively appointed residential program. It's quite unique. I don't think there's anything else like it, definitely not in the Ontario market that I'm aware of. And my idea, of course, around this was uh, from a variety of factors, of course, when COVID-19 hit, uh, we both found ourselves in a position uh, where we had to find a way to uh, sustain ourselves through our retirement. And the only other thing I knew was recovery and I think because I've I spent so long, I spent eight years in 12-step programs relapsing every year. And then when I found cognitive therapies through SMART, self-management and recovery training, that definitely uh, was a game changer for me because I managed for the first time in my recovery journey to sustain my recovery. I was I just celebrated uh, in, so I came to SMART in 2018 and I celebrated in 2022 at the recording of this episode, I celebrated four consecutive years of abstinence from my drug and alcohol addictions. So I'm passionate about sharing what has worked for me. And I don't believe that it takes a long time to recover. Uh, you know, we've developed this infrastructure and mindset around 30 day, 60 day, 90 day, 120 day residential recovery stays in, you know, a, a group setting, a boxed program. And I don't think it works for a lot of people. Um, that's the feedback that I'm getting for a lot of people who end up here, who have been through the 30, 60, 90 or 120 day rehab experiences and feel the same way that I did. It doesn't work for the majority of people. However, our government keeps spending millions of dollars on these programs without any accountability for results. So I wanted to prove in an outcome study that I could do in one week what's not being done in 30 days and I could do it better, less expensively and uh, more effectively for sure. So Red Roof Recovery was born and we are having great success with it. And of course, the key is to keep educating yourself and of course, stay engaged in your recovery because recovery doesn't take long. What it takes is a persistent willingness to exert consistent efforts to help yourself. And I offer a lifetime aftercare in this program. 
So what I'd like to talk about is the the expectations of someone when they go into recovery. Mm -hmm. And if I could just ask you to uh, speak a little bit louder, sweetheart, as well. Well, I can't speak that much more loud. Anyway. <laughs> Expectations um, around uh, rehab programs. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what I have noticed when um, when I've spoken to people who have been into rehab programs, and there's an expectation that um, it's a magic wand. You go in, mm -hmm. you spend your one week or your 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, whatever it is, and you come out the other end cured. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, when you went into rehab in Spain, and I come and picked you up, you were like the old person that I'd married. You were clear-eyed, you were vibrant, and you'd had a month of sobriety in this facility what went wrong as in you came out and you started drinking again mm -hmm. so was the expectation that you'd done the work and everything was going to be fine now well i think clearly uh there was a level of expectation that um there was a lack of aftercare uh, there wasn't even a whole lot of discussion. I didn't have a plan for my exit. What's the exit plan? There was no exit plan from this particular program. Now, I should also mention that um, this was a 12-step program in a residential rehab. Um, so it was a smaller smaller facility. I was lucky that I had my own bedroom and my own bathroom. So a little more conducive, I think, to healing for me. Um, I don't think I could ever go into a rehab and share a bathroom and a bedroom with somebody. That just wouldn't wouldn't work for me. And that's that's unfortunately what the model of recovery is, uh, for the most part, in this country, at least in Canada. And I think the exit plan, there might be some more uh, attention given to what what do you do afterwards because when I left in 2009 my 30 day it was wonderful to break the cycle that I had created for myself because you know I mean addiction is also just a really bad habit that needs to be broken it's you know mm -hmm. it, it had it had structure in my life that needed to be broken and I needed to learn how to live life without that routine and habit in my life anymore. Learning to live life and managing my emotions without drugs and alcohol. But there wasn't a big exit plan around that. I think maybe there might be more attention to the exit plan because I know places like uh, Homewood and Westover uh, do have aftercare programs. I think they're very expensive. Um, I don't know how much accountability is there, how much engagement is there. I really uh, can't speak to that, but I think that's key. You need to be engaged in the aftercare plan and you need to have the plan. I can't stress that enough. It's planning patient persistent, patient's persistence practice. You need to have a plan, an exit plan. How do you go back to your life, pick up the pieces and not go back? to the harmful substances and behaviors that you had before going in. Well, this is, this is what I was alluding to, is that even with an exit plan, it seems to me that people, a certain amount of people have an expectation that if they go into, you know, they realize that they've reached the point where they are, their life is unmanageable anymore, they need to do something about it. And they make the decision to go to rehab, whether it's, you know, a big facility, a small facility, it doesn't matter. And they go for this period of time and then they come out and go back to their lives and feel like everything should have, been, should have changed. Everything's going to be good now. And, and everything, everything can be good. 
when you stay engaged in your recovery. Like I said, recovery doesn't take long. It takes a persistent willingness to exert consistent efforts to help yourself. And that has to be every day. You know, um, building our emotional muscles is like building our physical muscles. You know, we would go to the gym or, you know, go for a walk or ride a bike or whatever you're doing to work your muscles, to build your strength and resilience physically. Uh, when you come out of recovery, you need to apply that same uh, fervor to keep your emotions in shape, you need to exercise them and work them and strengthen them and build your resilience. resilience. And that takes a daily effort. It doesn't take a big daily effort. I tell people you can do it for 10 minutes a day, structured, planned, ideally at the same time every day, but it doesn't take long. It just takes a consistent effort to help yourself every day. And there are hundreds of tools to choose from. I can't stress that enough. Uh, you know, people are coming up with these uh, one size fits all box programs. And you can't throw that at a bunch of people and hope it sticks to the majority. It just doesn't work because we're all different animals. We have different addictions. We have different metabolisms. We're going to respond differently to different tools. Uh, you know, a lot of people, when I say cognitive therapy, a lot of people in 12 steps says, no, no, I, 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 I can't get into that. You know, I, I'm, I like my higher power. You know, I do what works for me. And that's fantastic. Do what works for you. The key, the, the, my favorite acronym, the key, <laughs> keep educating yourself. Keep looking for something that works for you because there's hundreds of things to choose from. Mm -hmm. So what, another thing that I've, I've noticed is that one of the things that pushes people's addiction along is uh, circumstance. Circumstances and search situations, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Bad relationship, bad work environment, too much stress. And the expectation is after, you know, you've made the decision to go into rehab, there's a lack of willingness to do what needs to be done outside decisions. If you're in a really bad relationship and that's fueling your anxiety and your stress, Going back into that relationship, be it a friendship, a work, or a partnership, and expecting it to be different and you to be different, I think is somewhat wrong. I'm not many well, I, you know what? I still love 12 step programs. I think um, definitely 12 step programs are the, one of the best personal development programs on the planet. Uh, I love the slogans take what you need and leave the rest. Um, and stinking thinking, you know, you, you got to get hold of that stinking thinking and what to concentrate on the actions you're going to take to improve. Uh, you know, it's not what happens to us. It's how we respond to what happens to us. And I can't stress enough that you need a plan. You need an action plan. You need to set goals. You need to take the action steps every day to attain the goals. And that takes planning, patience, persistence, and practice. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I, I have seen that, let's just say that you, part of your, your daily life as a guy or your weekly life is going to the hockey game with your buddies and you get drunk at the hockey games almost and you come out of your rehab and you still go to the hockey games with your buddies who are getting drunk. Now, you know, when you have been successful in not only because of smart, but you made decisions of for a certain amount of time, you weren't going to be around certain people because they were triggers. Mm -hmm. And again, I, um, well, the, say, the saying is, if you sit in the barber chair long enough, you're going to get a haircut and we become the company we keep. So I had to make a decision and, that's, and that takes a grieving process as well that a lot of people don't want to face either. Um, you know, I've already, I'm already feeling deprived of the thing that I've given up that was giving me a lot of benefits, a lot of comfort. I've given up my addictions. Now you're telling me I have to give up my friends. I have to change my circle of friends. Yeah, sometimes you do. And that's not easy. And that's where some people can falter. 
Um, you know, we say addiction is a family affair as well. If you've got dysfunction at home as well in your relationships, that's going to be a challenge. So we have to, instead of concentrating on the symptoms, because that's what addictions are, they're symptoms to a deeper problem. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the cause. What is, what, what is creating the addiction? Like my favorite doctor, Dr. Gabor Mate says, stop asking why the addiction and start asking why the pain. We have to get to the cause, not instead of just treating the symptoms. Well, this is what I'm trying to wrap my head around is with people going into the rehab with this expectation that this period of time, the breaking of the habit is also going to fix everything that was fueling the reason why you had an addiction mm -hmm. and the unwillingness to change certain parts of that part of your life to facilitate your and then blaming that the the rehab didn't work right well yeah that that could be too um you know i i often say to people i would put that in the book of excuses but i'll bet you it's already there so you need to be ready right timing is everything if if you're not ready it's not going to work and a lot of people go into uh rehab on you know this this cycle, uh, hoping that it'll take this time. And, you know, really asking the deeper questions might, you might be better spending this some time to do some contemplation around uh, why it didn't work last time. No one seems to be asking and answering those questions is, you know, where did I falter? Uh, lapses and relapses are learning opportunities, but we need to take the time to reflect on what went wrong and what can we change? What are we willing to change? I've got this uh, saying on my desk, there are three solutions to every problem. You accept it, you change it, or you leave it. If you can't accept it, you change it. If you can't change it, you leave it. And that's, that's tough for a lot of people to wrap their head around that. If, okay. if it means so changing up friendships after giving up the addictions that were giving you a level of comfort and benefit and now you have to change your friendships and lose that too some people you know they have that that uh, outcome resistance the process resistance of recovery melting that away uh, is probably i would say one of the bigger steps for people is melting away that resistance to recover so let's talk about your <clears throat> when you went to rehab in spain and you know you you got to the point where you realized your life was unmanageable the way it was you reached out and serenity house got in touch and we decided that it would be best if you went and you went for the month and then you as i say i turned up to pick you up you looked totally different from that month, from when you went in to when you come out, you you looked totally different. You looked happy, fit, like you were enjoying life again. And then we come out. So what was your journey from that? What am I coming back to? That was one thing. So I was still mired in bureaucracy as well. Um, so, and I didn't have an exit plan. So what do I do? How am I gonna spend my time when I get out? That was the one thing. Uh, who am I going to hang around with? I had a very um, select group of friends and they were all dealing with their own issues around alcohol. So those were my only group of friends in a, in a country where I didn't speak the language. And, you know, that was kind of, I was kind of set up for failure there because I didn't have an exit plan. I didn't have a plan about how am I gonna step back into this life facing the same problems of bureaucracy and a group of friends who ha also had way too much time on their hands and loved to hang out in, in bars and drink and play cards and darts and you know just piss away life. Uh, what am, what's my exit strategy? What am I gonna do here? And I didn't have that. That's, I think that's where I failed. Whereas when I, when we came back to Canada and I was faltering in 12 steps for uh, the next eight years, I was learning each time uh, fr from each lapse and relapse I had, and then going to funerals. That was the eye opener for me. 
watching my peers not return from their relapses in 12-step programs, it was like, holy shit, it's just going to be a matter of time before I don't return from one of mine. I'm kidding myself. I need to find another solution. And that's when I went out looking for another solution. And in 2018, there wasn't a whole lot to choose from. There was SMART, Self-Management and Recovery Training out of Mentor, Ohio, and Life Ring, which started in Florida and started its uh, Canada growth, starting on the West Coast of Canada. And I resonated with SMART uh, for a couple of reasons. The Mentor, Ohio, <laughs> resonated with me because mentorship has always been you know, a, a relevant part of my life with my, my dad, who I call philosopher dad. He was a big fan of stoicism. So I grew up on philosophies and mentorship. So I liked the idea that SMART was founded by doctors. It was based in cognitive therapy and it was founded in Mentor, Ohio. So I chose SMART and I started doing SMART meetings in my community. Uh, and that, that was the big life changer, game changer for me is getting engaged in my recovery, creating a new group of friends who were on the same path and just keep doing it right? You find something that works, you keep doing it. You keep educating yourself. That's the key. Well, this is what I'm trying to, you know, get to the bottom of is that in Spain, you went to rehab and paid a fair, fair amount of money for that month and, <laughs> yes, did all the work and came out and it didn't stick. This time, and oftentimes the first time around won't stick, and you know, well, you then, then to... you're, you're not getting the support of your family and friends, right? Because oh my god, another failure, and then you have to carry that with you, and that can be an obstacle for seeking help because you feel like a failure. Oh, it didn't work. What, why would I go back to something that didn't work the first time? Well, mm -hmm. I mean, ask uh, what's his name, the uh, the guy who invented the light bulb, although. You know, there's speculation around who really did that too. Thomas Edison, you know, that seems to be a common um, thing that you hear about people. Well, Thomas Edison failed to make a light bulb for 10,000 tries, but he didn't quit. He just says he found 10,000 ways to not make a light bulb. And that's how you have to approach your recovery. You have to say, yes, I'm going in here with the intention that I'm going to succeed. But you also have to accept that you might falter and fail and trip and lapse. And what are you going to do? What's the plan? You need a plan. Have I mentioned you need a structured plan? <laughs> yeah, I have mentioned it once or twice. Mm -hmm. But I, as I say, I'm, I'm just a listener in this whole process. And, and a very an good one, I might add. Thank you. An observer as well. And what mm -hmm. I have observed is that quite a number of people think that rehab is a, go, a silver bullet. That you do your time, you're cured, and you can go back to your normal life, and everything's going to be fine. Mm. And when, when you think of it, I mean, yourself, you went to rehab in Spain and it didn't stick. You didn't go to rehab four years ago. No but it seems to be sticking because I, I have a persistent willingness to exert consistent efforts to help myself. I have a structured routine. I have a plan. I have tools that I use every day. Consistent. It's consistent. We get better when we systematically apply and reapply the tools that we find that work for us. Therein mm -hmm. lies the key. You need to find the tools that work for you and then you rinse and repeat, apply and reapply systematically. And then just by rote, you create the, you know, this neuroplasticity of our brain. We're retraining our brain. We need to override those neural networks that are not serving us. So that negative default, we call it the ANTS, A-N-T-S, automatic negative thoughts. We need to groove new neural networks, new pathways that are, that are going to create the, the, the default of thinking is going to be positive and empowering instead of negative and harmful. 
So what you're saying is that rehab should be viewed as has the lessons to teach you the tools for the rest of your life. An opportunity to learn what resonates with you and what doesn't. And, you know, a lot of rehabs, they have a boxed program or maybe, you know, another, the, some, some rehabs say, you know, well, we've got this 12 step option or we've got smart or we've got life ring or whatever, right? It, it, but it's still a boxed program and you need, you need to find, it, there's no such thing as one size fits all. You need to customize the recovery program for you, which is why I think my approach to recovery uh, saying, you know what, it doesn't take long. You know, we've, we've, we've adopted this infrastructure and this mindset around recovery that it takes a long time. And I don't think it does. It takes a commitment, it takes motivation, and it takes a structured routine. It's good to get out of the environment for a, a set time. And I think one week is enough. I've set it up for someone like me who didn't want to take a month away from life responsibilities and work responsibilities. You come here Friday after work and we are knee to knee 12 hours a day until the following Friday. It's immersive, it's exhaustive and it's effective because it's customized, it's personalized to the person and we're all different. But you're still just giving the person the tools and where to find the tools and what options they've got. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if they think that any program is a magic bullet, if they don't take those tools and apply every day, then they're setting themselves up for failure. Right. Is addiction, can you be cured from an addiction? I don't believe you can. I think it's a biological vulnerability that we're born with and we can learn how to manage and learn how to regulate healthy dopamine levels. So we don't have to go to things like um, harmful substances and behaviors to get those dopamine levels uh, you know, that, that you just ha have, you know, that, that nice flow of life. So you can ride the waves of life without having harmful substances and behaviors. Yes. I know exactly and that, that doesn't take long. It just takes a consistent effort. So it, are, are we ever cured? I used to believe I was cured. I would have a year of abstinence and think, oh yeah, I'm fine now. I can go out and have just, you know, a pill or two or a drink or two just to take the edge off. And that's never going to be part of, that's never part of my life ever. And that took acceptance, unconditional acceptance of myself, of others, and of life. And how's that working for you? It's working great. And I have this little unconditional acceptance meme. You can email me at redroofrecovery at gmail.com. And I'll send you this little meme to remind you of, the fact that we are all fallible humans. And this was the game changer for me, unconditional acceptance of self, others, and life. And I have it to where I can see it. And I'm right, reminded every day. It's like, oh, okay, excellent. Well, sweetheart, wow, Za, we're coming to the end of our time together. Thank you so much. Another wonderful conversation with you as always. It's been a pleasure again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I hope, um, thank you for listening, for hanging out with us for this 30 minutes. You are an integral part of my recovery journey. So thanks for your support. If you found this interesting and thought provoking and helpful, uh, perhaps you could share it with your friends and send some support our way. We would love that. And if you think you or someone you know might qualify for this unique residential recovery program, by all means, reach out, redroofrecovery at gmail.com. Remember, there's a great deal of power in knowing that the only thing we can control in life is ourselves. May the force be with you. And remember, you are the force.